great. Thank you, Jacob. Let me pray as we begin. Heavenly Father, we always need your help uh, to understand your word. And we pray for that help this morning. And we pray that uh, we might know your presence amongst us. And having heard your voice, we would know we've heard the voice of the living God. And we ask that for Christ's sake. Amen. Knowing God and making him known, that's our tagline. And if our banner hadn't broken, it would be in front of you this morning, as always. Summarises really what we're about at Trinity. But the trouble with taglines is that they're taglines. You know, what do they actually mean? I mean, knowing God, what does knowing God mean? Not knowing about him, but knowing him. What is the experience of knowing him like? How do we make him known? What's the way to do that? And if someone to come along and claim that they know they knew God, how would such a claim be assessed? When the New Testament speak in terms of knowledge of God, they tend to speak in the categories of faith, love, and hope. Faith, trusting God in his word, in his work. That love, love for God, his people, and obedience to him. And hope, hope. And that's something that we're going to learn a great deal about as we uh, begin a series in Ezekiel over the next few weeks. All of us have some hope or another. You know, it may be not be terribly conscious one, it, it may be dim, it may be vague, it may be informal, it may even be a deluded one, but it'll be there. Because without hope, well, life becomes hopeless. If there's no hope, there's really only despair. If there's nothing to live for, if there's no future worth having, life becomes intolerable. And so when things get tough, when they get unbearably tough, when the situation that we're in becomes intolerable, human beings, in order to live... We give ourselves some hope of some kind or another. I wonder what your hope is. Your light at the end of the tunnel that keeps you going through the hard times. The Bible makes clear that the proper way for human beings to have hope is to know God. To know God, the true and living God, the God who is there and who has made himself known. To know that God is to have hope. Hope, a solid confidence in the future. To know that is to have hope. Well, to learn something of that hope, we're traveling back, may seem a bit bizarre, but we're traveling back to the sixth century BC, to the time of Ezekiel. Uh, And it's a dark time. It's a dark time in many ways, a bit like the Dark Ages. Uh, Most of us know very little about that time. Uh, But it's dark for another reason. It's dark because it's a period in the Old Testament when God's people have lost all hope. Listen to how they speak later on in the book. They cry out, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. But if that is the situation that they were in, perhaps the obvious question to ask ourselves is, well, why go here to learn about hope? What can their experience possibly say to me? How can it speak to our hopes when they had none? And the answer is, uh, without giving anything away, and I hope will become clear over the next few weeks, that their hopelessness is the background against which we begin to see more clearly the character of true hope, biblical hope, hope that has God in it. Now, a couple of points this morning. I'll spend a little bit of time waggling on the tee this morning. Not too long, I hope. But just a couple of points before we dive into our text this morning. 
And that, let's first just remember, remind ourselves a little bit about the time that we're going back to, the 6th century BC. Now, this may or may not be helpful if it isn't just ignore it, but uh, if it is, it may be helpful to remind ourselves that we're at the end of Old Testament history. That's the storyline that we're in. The, the once great nation under David, oh, that doesn't work, under David, that doesn't work either, never mind. Um, the once great nation under David really is no more. Uh, the land that most of the nation has uh, will be lost, really. All that's left is a, left is a small rump of Judah on her last legs. About eight, 100 years before Ezekiel's time, the Assyrians had swept in and swept away the northern kingdom. Most of Israel had been lost. All that remained was a little rump of a state around Jerusalem. It survived the onslaught of the Assyrians, but... Um, as, uh, as we know, if we know our history and we know if we know our Collins songs, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. And the Assyrians had fallen and the Babylonians had risen and they'd swept away the Assyrians. And now in 597 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar, with his armies, come from the south and besiege Jerusalem. And this time, Judah doesn't stand. The king is captured, the city is plundered. A puppet king, King Zedekiah, is on the throne. And all the good and the great and the nobles and the, and the artisans, if that's the right word, are carted off to Babylon. Little Judah, that last remnant of a once great nation, is crushed. Not completely destroyed at this point. Yes, the leaders have been carried off and the king is no more than a puppet, but the temple is there still. And so begins a period of uh, the history in the Bible known as the exile, because all that's left of the nation is pretty much in exile in Babylon. All the movers and shakers far, far away from the land. And one of those in that, uh, those people carted off to Babylon was a man, not yet 30, a priest in training by the name of Ezekiel. And as Jeremiah will bring God's word to those left in Judah, Ezekiel will now bring God's word to those in exile. And we'll have much to say about their hopes. So that's the time we're in. But it's important as we dive into Ezekiel to understand a little bit about the significance of this time that we'll be reading of. Because what happened when Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem and what was going to happen in the next 10 years or so, at the time that Israel, uh, Ezekiel is speaking, is a complete disaster. Because there's an aspect to the destruction of this nation that is completely unlike the destruction of any other nation or every other battle that we read about. I mean, history is scattered with tragedies, isn't it? Nations being destroyed, other nations rising up, conflicts, defeats. There's loads of them in the past and even today. But there's a dimension about this one that is not obvious when you look at it. If you were to judge by outward appearances, well, on the scale of things, it would hardly be worth remembering, a small skirmish. But there's a dimension to this defeat that is unique. Appearances don't tell you everything. And as Jeremiah will remind those in Judah, and as we'll see, Ezekiel will remind those in exile, all that has happened and all that will happen is nothing less than the judgment of God on them. You see, conquering armies are terrifying. I mean, I've never had to fight in a war, thankfully, but I can imagine it's absolutely terrifying to see an army march against you. And Nebuchadnezzar and his armies, I'm sure, were terrifying for those in Jerusalem. 
That was awful. But what raises this to another level is that behind, as one writer has put it, behind the Babylonian jackboot is the fist of God. I mean, knowing Nebuchadnezzar is against you is one thing. That's bad enough. That's hopeless enough. But to realize, to understand, to begin to appreciate that behind the power of Nebuchadnezzar stands the power of Almighty God and to understand that he was against you, then you begin to understand how hopeless your situation is. Because if God is against you, Almighty God, if he's against you, what hope can there possibly be? Well, it's into this situation that Jeremiah and Ezekiel will speak. And at this point, if I was David Robertson and we were listening to the We Flee podcast, which I know some of you listen to, but if, if I were he and this were a podcast, at this point he would play some music from a little-known Canadian band from the 70s, back when Turner Overdrive, and their hit... I think it's about their only hit, You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet. And the chorus goes, I won't sing it, You know, you know, you know, you just ain't seen nothing yet. Because that is Ezekiel's message in summary. What you have seen, you exiles, so far. Well, you know, you know, you know. You ain't seen nothing yet. What you have seen, what you have experienced so far, is just the beginning. Christians are prone to quote that verse in the New Testament, aren't they? Um, If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, that wasn't the question in Ezekiel's time and place. The questions um, Ezekiel's message will pose, the question in 597 BC was, if God is against us, who can be for us? What hope can there possibly be? But what, hope, what is this relevance to us sitting not by the river of Babylon, but uh, in a school hall in, uh, well, in Lancaster, aren't we? Living this side of Jesus Christ coming, does it really matter anymore? I mean, isn't this just history? Well, to answer that, we need to remember that the Bible, the story of the Bible, is a movement from promise to fulfillment, from shadow to substance. Why does it matter? Well, because we need to remember and reflect on the fact that although this time is unfamiliar, I guess, to many of us, unknown to most, that the people there, under the shattering judgment of God, well, it's, if you like, it's a picture in miniature of our world as it is today. A world who has heard from God in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the shattering news to Israel then, the message of God to Israel in Babylon in Exwell then, that he was against them, is the same news and the same message that now comes to the whole world in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message, God's message to us and to our world is the same as that message to to the exiles back then. It's a message that reveals an aspect, a a dimension of the darkness and the suffering and the trials and tribulations of our own age that is utterly shattering. It's a message of the gospel that begins with a recognition, an understanding that God is against us, that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people in the whole world. A world, an account of the gospel that goes on to describe as full of people where no one is righteous, where all have turned away, and where the whole world will be held accountable to God. You see, this awful position of Israel in Babylon is a situation, is one in which all people find themselves. We all find ourselves facing God's judgment. I mean, what if you begin to see, if you begin to understand that behind the trials and sufferings and tragedies 
and the fears that we all face and eventually experience to one degree or another, what if you begin to see that behind the suffering of the world, behind it all, is the hand of God? That when all is said and done, he is against us. He is against the world. Well, when we begin to see that, when we begin to understand that judgment of God is not a fantasy, it's not a figment of a a fervid religious imagination, it's not make-believe, it exists, it's real, it's a solid reality, a reality that touches us all and shapes our destiny. What, What then? What hope then? What hope can there be if God is against you? Well, Ezekiel's message, as he spoke to Israel's situation back then, speaks no less to our situation than of all people today under the judgment of God. And over the next few weeks, and we will in a moment, begin to look at that message. And it's fair to say that hopelessness is a big part of it. Uh, Many, many chapters. The first 33 chapters are a message of hopelessness and we'll be dipping in and out of it. There is a message of hope. It does come eventually. If we follow the story to the end, there will be hope, but not at first. Not yet. And it's important that we understand the hopelessness of this message. The hopelessness of all their other hopes before we get to it. Well, let's get to our text this morning, chapter 1, uh, page 830, I think, uh, if I've got that right. The story, the book begins three years or so after that first deportation to Babylon. Verse 1, in my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kiba River. So Ezekiel is there, he's sitting by the river in Babylon, It's, I'm told, the pundits tell me, the 27th of July, 593 BC. He's now 30 years old, and sitting there by the river, it happened. What happened? Well, something quite extraordinary. Uh, What exactly? Well, you read it. See if you can work it out. I mean, it is quite extraordinary. It's difficult, really, to understand it, even uh, when it's read to us so well by Jacob. And it's difficult to understand, I'm sure, not least because it's describing something that human words can't describe. What he saw that day, it's a little unclear exactly what he saw, isn't it? Although this much is clear about it, that in a land far, far away from Jerusalem, far from the temple, in a pagan land, the heavens opened and Ezekiel saw... Well, you can read what he saw. What's it all about? What's it all mean? Well, thankfully, we don't have to uh, wonder, he tells us. Do you see the last verse of the chapter, verse 28? What did he see? He saw the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He saw in normal circumstances what no human can see. He caught a glimpse of the glory and the majesty of Almighty God. And it was overwhelming. He was overwhelmed. He saw it and fell down on his face. It was overwhelming. But what he saw that day was just the beginning, if you like, just the fanfare, just the overture, the prelude, if you like, to the main event. Do you see that? Because then he heard the voice of God. Chapter 2, verse 1. The words of the Lord came to him. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet and I heard him speaking to me. Now that is terrifying. Do you remember when Moses and Israel were at Mount Sinai? There was a huge amount of things going on. There was fire, there was smoke, there were earthquakes. But what terrified Israel at the time was none of that. What terrified Israel 
was the voice of God. So terrified that he begged, they begged that God wouldn't speak to them directly. Well, the word of God came to Ezekiel that day and he would never be the same again. What was that word? Well, we'll be seeing in the next few weeks, but just notice four things this morning, will you, from these few verses. Firstly, notice, will you, that Ezekiel is going to be a prophet. Verse 3, he said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites. Verse 4b, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. So Ezekiel is going to be a prophet. He's going to take God's word to Israel. He is someone sent by God to speak God's word. That's what a prophet is in the Old Testament. God spoke to Ezekiel so that God's word would come to the Israelites. That's what God is like. He is a God who ensures his people hear his word. He ensures his word is spoken to his people and he sends his word into the world. Secondly, do you note know, you know who he sends that word to? Quite striking, I think, verse 3. I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. He's sending his word to a bunch of rebels. That's how he describes them. That's what they were, rebels in revolt against their God. I mean, that's why they're in the mess that they're in. That's how they've ended up in exile. But no, will you, he, he doesn't send his word to those who deserve it. They haven't done anything to warrant hearing it. He doesn't send his word to the religiously inclined. They have no desire to hear from God. They're hostile to him. But again, again, that's what our God is like. He sends his word to such people. And thirdly, will you note, at this stage, we're not given much indication of what that word is, what he's going to say. We don't know what he'll say. Uh, Come back uh, to find that out. But what we do learn is that what he says will be what God says. He will announce that God's word has come to them. Listen, he'll say, God has spoken. And of course, that's news in itself, isn't it? Even before you hear what God has to say, and they'll hear that, that God has spoken is news worth knowing. Even if you're stubborn and rebellious, even if your heart is hostile, which theirs was. And fourth and final thing, do you note, as you see here, the purpose of it all? God is sending Ezekiel as a prophet to be among them so that, well, so that what? So that they will know that a prophet has been among them. Which all sounds a bit circular, doesn't it, really? Until we think about the implication of it. That whether they like it or not, whether they listen or not, whether they hear what he has to say or not, there is a word from God that they've received. And however they receive it, they will know sooner or later that they have received it. And Ezekiel has been sent to them with that purpose. Now, if you're a rebellious house, if you're a stubborn people of God, as Israel was, that news is actually quite terrifying, if you think about it. Because if you're hostile to God, you don't actually want to hear that God has a word for you. You see, life could otherwise go on, couldn't it? Like life in our world, it can go on and not be that bad. You know, they could make the best of their situation in Babylon, you know, settle down, 
uh, start a business, start a family, and they could begin to think, actually, that perhaps things aren't that bad after all. Got a family, got a house, got a job. And perhaps they might even think, well, you know, things could even improve in time. You know, Jerusalem's still there, the temple's still there. One day maybe the politics will change and we'll, we'll go back. You know, tomorrow will be a better day. And at this point, if it was a We Free podcast, David Robinson would uh, play, well, the Labour Party theme from 1997, things can only get better. It's not that bad, but it'll get better. It's the only way it can happen. There is hope. All is not lost. Jerusalem is there. Things will get better. The only way is up. As we read Ezekiel, we'll discover that that was basically their refrain. Just as it is for many people today who keep despair at bay by fondling imagining that things will get better, the only way is up, progress will go on. But you can only do that, of course, if you keep God out of your mind, out of the picture. If you ignore God's word of warning. But God has sent Ezekiel to them to warn them, to make sure that they understand that all such hope is false hope. For they will know that a prophet has been amongst them with a message from God. And just a quick quick example of the sort of things that he'll say uh, later on, almost chosen at random. Ezekiel's God word to them, I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. I will surely repay you for your conduct and for your detestable practices among you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Or a few verses on, the king will mourn, the prince will be clothed with despair, and the hands of the people of the land will tremble. I will deal with them according to their conduct and their own standards. Their own standards I'll do with them even. And I will judge them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Backman Turner Overdrive again. Guys, you ain't seen nothing yet, says the prophet. For the judgment of God is not over. It's not yet come in its full and terrible fullness. But know this, it will come. Well, that's not a terribly happy note to end on, is it? There's more to be said about God's judgment. There's more that Ezekiel has to say about true hope. But I hope what we've begun to see here is that the word of God that has come to us in the gospel, the word of God to Ezekiel, through Ezekiel to the exiles, reveals the reality of God's wrath. And as we begin to see that, we can actually begin to see the reality of it that shatters false confidence, false hopes, calls out human hubri, shatters self-confidence, shatters the hopeless hopes that we create for ourselves. And as we begin to see that, we can begin to see the hope that Ezekiel will bring. This word to God to them is not remote from us. It's a word for us. Yes, the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a message of hope, real hope, sound hope, substantial hope, sure hope, certain hope. But if we're to know that hope, if we're to have that hope, We need to understand the hopelessness of all other hopes in the face of a God who is against us. And the hopelessness of putting our hopes in anything else. And this morning we need to realize that all people, whether they know it or not, whether they care or not, stand under God's righteous judgment. And his word has come to them, has come to us to people in a situation of utter hopelessness. And it's a word that comes to us through the Lord Jesus that gives us hope, real hope, certain hope, sure hope. We must be concerned to hear that word that he sent to us. He sent his word to us so that we might know that his word has been amongst us.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that your word uh, describes reality as it is. And that we see in it the consequences of being a rebellious uh, people. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that your word describes the hopelessness of having God against you. And thank you, Heavenly Father, also it is a word of hope that comes to us in the Lord Jesus. May we understand that all hopes beside that are hopeless. And we pray that for Christ's sake. Amen.